Lego! Hey guys, SMT is back, and okay, there's something I've been mulling over for a while now, and this is going up later than intended. I touched on this in my most recent Paper Mario video, if its hatred stems from nostalgia or not. So not too long ago, there's been a fan game being developed for the past 10 years by this one incredible dude, a Metroid 2 remake. Fans downloaded it, were shocked at how great it was, and was a fantastic game. And in a couple days, despite being almost completely tacit and silent about it, it got taken down. Why? Nintendo, why? What are you doing? This isn't the first time either, a fan-made Pokemon called Pokemon Uranium recently got taken down in over a day, a Super Mario 64 HD remake a while back got taken down by Nintendo, Nintendo previously shut down Mike McGee and Scott Lenninger's The Legend of Zelda 3D browser game in April, the Patreon for Alvin Earthworm's fantastic Super Mario Bros. Z fan animation was also closed by Nintendo in February, they shut down a Legend of Zelda fan-made movie off YouTube, The Hero of Time, which got back up a little afterwards. They took down a spin-off of No Man's Sky turned into No Mario Sky. Nintendo's now copywriting Let's Plays and videos having any affliction with their IPs, even to two seconds of their own music. Where and why the fuck is all this happening, Nintendo? Like, seriously, what, what, what is the problem? They're being massively strict and uptight about fans creating, releasing fan-made products, and acknowledging and supporting their own IPs, yet no matter how much hard work and dedication is being put into them, they want to claim it and shut it down, so more often than not they can make a quick buck or something? What kind of shit is this? What's laughable is that, in regards to the whole Metroid 2 remake, the past couple years, Nintendo's ignored Metroid as a whole, ignored its birthday, its 30th anniversary, happy birthday Samus, have not acknowledged it on social media or anything, but decide to take down a fan-made product on it, even when Federation Force was due out this past month, yet despite it's a spin-off, not a main Metroid, has different gameplay and whatnot. And fans are not only hating on this game, despite it'll likely get the Star Fox Zero treatment, meaning it'll be decent, but with the naive and ignorant nature of Nintendo recently, and lack of innovation heart and soul, they'll also take offense and will leave a dark, greedy, selfish, and bad image on Nintendo as a whole, especially with all the other examples I stated before. This isn't the first time this has happened, of course. Many people beyond fans are whittling down Nintendo's reasons and conclusions to not just gaining fans revenue and such, but also because they fear their fans and their creations. <laughs> what? What kind of fucking reason is that? I'm piling these concerns on top of what I mentioned in the Paper Mario video, discussing what problems Nintendo has with their IPs and themselves. The problems I mentioned in that video, I'll bring up here. The problems and issues regarding Nintendo and their IPs are these six. Their blind and naive, ignorant and carefree actions, their lackluster and mediocre efforts on game production, their synchronization with their fans and consumers, their synchronization with their franchises and their natures, their ambitious and intuitive game designs and the mechanics, and their overall market and fan medium. Now let me go over these one by one, so stay with me. How are they being blind and ignorant, SMT? Look at Paper Mario Color Splash and Metroid Prime Federation for us. Now before you fucking go ahead and thumbs down the video, completely forget what the games have that are right or wrong for now, and look at these from a business and marketing perspective. Color Splash, a brand new Paper Mario for Wii U and HD. The one on 3DS so well, so they adopt the gameplay from that and pull it over here. So what's wrong with that? A couple things. One, they, and even you guys, forget the fact that the 3DS sold well altogether, and the gameplay shown off was reminiscent to that of the Thousand Year Door, therefore giving Sticker Star solid ground to stand on for blind sales. This false advertising, in a way, is one issue because many consumers were let on. Two, the Wii U sales were worse than the GameCube and barely did any better than the Sega Dreamcast. If GameCube sales were poor, along with the Thousand Year Door and Paper Mario 64, compared to Sticker Star, why didn't they factor the consoles marketing too. Also, which is something you guys keep forgetting, Super Paper Mario sold the most out of any Paper Mario, so I could argue why Nintendo didn't even adopt the gameplay from that game instead. I loved and was genuinely interested in Super Paper Mario, even if it was completely different. It shook up the formula enough to have character, personality, story, overall substance, which is something Sticker Star and Color Splash lack. They're just slapping the Mario brand on a console, hoping it'll sell well, but God knows all first party developers will be moving to the NX once this comes out, as well as consumers and fans, and even when this game drops, the Wii U will already be a thing of the past because the NX is coming out early spring, as well as details on the console before Color Splash. 
Splash even drops. While we're on sales, let me say quick, I personally think Color Splash will be a drop in the bucket, mostly in the same vein as Star Fox Zero and Metroid Prime Federation Force, because even if the gameplay and controls are different, even if it's a spinoff, even if the game itself may be ultimately decent and better than expected, it's steering away from what made it so memorable, fans are being rubbed the wrong way, and for all we know, this could have been some random title that wouldn't get any spotlight if Mario or Metroid wasn't on there, but because it is, and it's vastly different from what it is, fans are not going to pick it up. It's left a bad impression on itself and Nintendo for doing so and acts as an insult towards the consumers and fans in an effort to use the brand for money. Especially towards Metroid fans because these two games are getting incredibly similar treatment and feedback for similar reasons. Federation Force is a spinoff with different gameplay and different design that's overall likely to be decent, but it's not what Metroid was or is, and is using the Metroid brand to promote what was originally a secondary title is again insulting. I get it's a spinoff, it's different, etc. But to out of the blue give a secondary title such as Blast Ball the Metroid brand a day after it was shown off at last year's E3, as well as keep some Metroid elements while losing others, is a detriment to the franchise in some ways. Metroid fans aren't going to ignore those. Speaking of confusing time slots, one reason this game duped was their planning and timing for this game to come out. Federation Force was being developed back when the DSi was a thing, however because of Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, Next Level Games decided to drop it, finish Luigi, pick it back up and then sell it. Holding off on a spin-off Metroid on Metroid's 30th anniversary and around half a decade since the last Metroid game we got, this game just came out at a bad time and that's likely gonna hurt it in the long run. Another reason is the fact that it is a spin-off. In one way, the game itself may be decent enough to buy, of course. Spin-off, it's not hurting the main series. Different taste? Sure. But there are two sides to every story. I know Metroid is about exploration and isolation, and this game suffers from subpar slash off-putting graphics, which are ultimately insignificant in the long term. The lack of the franchise's main protagonist, which is reduced to a cameo, the heavy focus on the first-person shooter aspect and multiplayer instead, despite it's a spinoff again, blindly abusing the brand and ignoring the fans as well as the franchise's nature. The fact that it's a spinoff is backfiring on them because, okay, it's a different take on Metroid, but it's not affiliating with the core game. But despite it's a spinoff again, the use of the Metroid brand will give people those false hopes that'll likely be shattered because it lost some of that Metroid charm. It's literally like Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric, even if you completely take away the fact it's a terribly flawed and incomplete game. The brand will give people the wrong idea despite it's a spinoff and going towards a different demographic, but that can fall on the consumer too for putting those hopes up too high as well. They should have either held off until a different main Metroid was made or scrapped it altogether because the way it is now, it's not doing justice for them. Same for Color Splash being one of the last Wii U titles, and Star Fox Zero is our next example. It's another Star Fox 64 retread with motion controls, something almost everyone is tired of, and they're even jarring too which adds to that problem. There's wasted potential, the IP has been remade over and over again in almost the exact same format, only differing in controls and some gameplay, and this is putting a damper on Star Fox as a whole, not to mention they keep enforcing different gimmicks in these games and the gameplay styles. There is that whole don't knock it if you didn't try it, but again, like I said in the Paper Mario video, Sticker Star was like that, but almost everyone universally hated that game because it was so different, and in a way, they were tricked into a Super Mario 3D Land-esque Paper Mario. In some cases, if they show enough, you can get a general idea of what the game will show, tell, and feel like. In the case of Paper Mario, we got a few trailers, 40 plus minutes of gameplay, plus the interview with the assistant producer. It is indeed Sticker Star improved, but because Sticker Star left a bad impression on most people, that's not going to bode well for the game itself even if it's improved. Hell, just playing Sticker Star itself will give you enough indication of how Color Splash will play. We know what the game will generally be like, and it's all a matter of whether we should risk our time and money for that or not. And let me just say right now, telling us to not knock a product until we buy it and try it is completely separate from your basic scenarios of that saying where it comes into play like trying a new food or a made-up game. Sometimes it's not just, oh, I know what the game will be like, I know it's gonna suck, what we've received from trailers, gameplay videos, etc. It's also, more primarily, <clears throat> okay, from what I've seen, what I've gathered, and what I genuinely heard about the game, keyword genuinely, I'm ultimately not in favor of what they're doing with this game. However, there is a different sort of charm being thrown in there, and the graphics are good. This game, I feel like, will ultimately be average, but because it's not what we were expecting, and it's missing some elements from what made me love the series to begin with, it's not going to do well. Should I risk using my money and time for that, or skip the purchase?
I feel like that's how it is for most people and it should be. Not just a matter of what we've seen and what to expect, but how you feel about it. How you believe the game will do in quality and sales. What you should feel and do about the game logically and determine whether or not it's for you. There's also this joke flying around that people like to complain about and dislike games that they never played. And if that's taken literally, you're failing to understand and see the bigger picture and would just shame and degrade those who feel like that because you'd rather be among that niche who make fun of something and or others without understanding nor accepting someone's views and reasons for that specific topic. The world revolves around misunderstanding, and through misunderstanding comes antagonism, unacceptance, and ignorant, uneducated minds. That's why we should try and understand and see both sides of every story. See what tastes you and others have and just accept them and move on. It's not always blind hate and degrading people and products and such. There are several stories to people's experiences and it takes some time to understand how those people feel. That's also kind of why people see reviews and such, to give that sense and taste of what the game will be like for someone who's played it and who will likely prefer the game more. To see which game satisfies your taste and let's not forget which reviewer matches your taste too. And it's Nintendo's job to grasp our interests, make us actually consider purchasing it, and it can be done if the product is convincing enough. In some ways, I can see people's overreactions towards Paper Mario because of how much they keep pushing the fact it's a sequel of the most controversial and hated Paper Mario game of all time, and it'll potentially be the basis of the series. You can't really blame them for being so pessimistic. With Paper Mario, you can see how Color Splash and Sticker Star are shells of the former treasures, but that's because Nintendo didn't sell it and make the games convincing and worthwhile for the purchase. Now I'm not saying it's easy making a product that'll be high quality and guarantee big bucks, but in Paper Mario's case, it shouldn't be too difficult considering what everyone keeps clamoring for in the series, but what do I know? I don't make those games. And as time passes, I'm more and more neutral about Paper Mario Color Splash. It has character and charm, which I love, but it lacks creativity, innovation, and is still bland and stale in characters, design, and gameplay. If anything, that game can be compared to not so much Super Paper Mario, but Mario & Luigi Paper Jam for having almost the same exact qualities, except Paper Jam's gameplay was super solid. Now on to the next issue. What lackluster and mediocre efforts on game production can you show? The Mario Party series, specifically 9 and 10, primarily in the lack of interesting and innovative minigames, linear boards, and the shifts from the first 8 Paper Marios as well as the DS one. 2D Mario, slapping on the same 2D gameplay we got ever since New Super Mario Bros. from the DS. Only different power-ups and a few new enemies, but everything else is relatively the same ever since the Wii version came to pass. Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer, but especially Amiibo Festival for the mixed to negative reception, straying and changing the Animal Cross formula. Despite those are the only Animal Crossing spin-offs, being really Amiibo heavy, etc. Star Fox Zero for making the game so complex and heavy with motion controls and it jars the experience for most people. It's something you can adapt to, but it expects you to learn all those controls off the bat, and there's very little tutorial to help. There's that massive learning curve, there's also the lack of potential of pushing the boundaries for Star Fox. Most of the Mario sports titles too, primarily tennis for being more and more bland and boring, and the others for not being given much light of day. Speak of the devil, some of the 3DS games we got in the Direct are another example, Mario Sports Superstars, despite being the only curious 3DS title on my list, it ultimately looks bland. But I could be wrong. But more tennis? More golf? After how many games we got of those sports so far, not just on 3DS but on Wii U too? They look almost exactly the same. Soccer and baseball look more generic compared to Mario Superstar Baseball, Mario Sluggers, and Mario Strikers. Horse racing I'm not that hyped for. Yoshi's Woolly World and Super Mario Maker being ported over to 3DS, which not only shows they're trying to make more money by porting the successful Wii U games to 3DS, but this is making the Wii U even more redundant. Hyrule Warriors Legends and Smash 3DS can apply to this as well, but not with the issue of lackluster or game production. Paper Mario Sticker Star for reasons I've already explained in the past and I'm sure you all watching this now know very well yourselves. I'm trusting you. Even some of the 3D Mario games nowadays, primarily the 3D titles, 3D Land and 3D World are good, don't get me wrong, but they took a couple steps back in regards to a proper 3D Mario experience. They were solid, but it feels like New Super Mario Bros. became 3D. <clears throat> Most of these games feel average, and Nintendo taking precautionary measures and making sure the game sells safely, which is something the 3DS Direct overall felt as well. 
Now, SMT, you covered the first two issues. How have they desynchronized with their fans and consumers? The Paper Mario videos I already did is one example. I also practically explained this in the first issue. You know how I mentioned Paper Mario, Star Fox, Metroid, the 3DS games, etc. Speaking of which, the ports were not what the original games themselves were supposed to be. I'm mostly talking about Mario Maker 3DS. You have creating your own level, sure. But wasn't Mario Maker a hit for sharing courses online? Yeah, and the 3DS is only adopting local play, which is fine if you do, but nobody does local play anymore. Everything's online. Not to mention the 3DS is going to subtract some of the features the Wii U version had. And there's also potentially the Pikmin game coming out. It somewhat applies because it doesn't have all the elements of Pikmin in there, but it's like Paper Mario. It's not a side-scroller, it's not what Pikmin fans expected, it's not what Pikmin fans wanted, etc. And for all we know as of now, this could be the alleged Pikmin 4 because it hasn't been confirmed yet, so we don't know. And also, this I touched on the video as it started, the whole drama between making fan creations with Nintendo's IPs. We're expressing our love, dedication, and faith to Nintendo and their IPs through fan-made games, videos, and such towards them and their IPs. How can anyone do that if Nintendo's shutting them down and or claiming money from them? It's their IP, sure, I get it, but wouldn't this basically strengthen their overall fan following and marketing? I mean, that's what Sega's doing with Sonic Mania. Christian Whitehead is a fan of Sonic. He got hired for the production behind Sonic Mania. He knows what classic Sonic is about, and is not only delivering a solid classic 2D Sonic game, but is extraordinarily pleasing fans of Sonic by a long shot. Sega hires fans and creators inspired by them to create better projects and improve their status and fan following, but Nintendo doesn't want fans to create anything having to do with them? What? There's also something about Nintendo's desynchronization with their fan bases that has caused a seriously major, dare I say cancerous after effect with their decisions and gimmicks on games and such. With all the changes and decisions they've made and everyone's defense and offense towards some games, choices, elements, etc., it's dividing the fan base within Nintendo. It doesn't matter if there's an understanding or not, there's just simple unacceptance and there's constant banter between Nintendo fans over which games are good, which ones are bad, which elements work and which ones don't, which gimmicks are great, which ones are unnecessary, and we decipher these fans and voluntarily throw them in these subgenres and niches and whatnot. Okay, so what I mean by this is, you know how much shit the Sonic fanbase gets for the bad OCs, the fan comics, the constant illogical complaining yet not every Sonic fan out there is like that at all? So they have subsections, the bad Sonic fans, the good Sonic fans, the classic Sonic fans, the modern Sonic fans, the decent Sonic fans, the cancerous Sonic fans, and we nitpick their qualities on whether they're okay or autistic, oh my god. I feel sick saying those kinds of words. And there's this huge expanded barrier across certain fans who like certain things. Paper Mario fans are being compared to Sonic fans in regards to the quote unquote illogical complaining, gameplay gimmicks and elements, and childish voices. Same for the Metroid fans, Star Fox fans, F-Zero fans, Mother 3 fans, regular Mario fans, etc. And everyone fan or not of these games will throw them in these little niches and look down on them. Despite some being more vocal and passionate about certain topics, despite there being logical and reasonable views on certain subjects, they're still being thrown down and degraded by other fans, whether they're understood or not. It's really sad. Not only does Nintendo lose their groove with their fans, but their choices and actions cause the fans to divide and separate among themselves even more when we can't even get along. I get shit for speaking about Paper Mario and voicing what's right and wrong, and they automatically throw me in the crybaby Paper Mario fanboy section. No matter how much logic I throw in there, no matter how reasonable my approach is, they just assume and refuse to accept because they don't like how I dislike something for several reasonable reasons. It's sad, and it's super annoying. So how is Nintendo desynchronized with their franchises and natures? Going back to Star Fox Zero again for the controls and wasted potential of a new fresh Star Fox game. Paper Mario, again, I sound like a broken record, I'm sorry. Mario Party 9, 10, and Star Rush. Mario Party Star Rush is now a Mario Party focused more on these different modes, Toad Scramble, a grid-based mode with boss battles and others, and it's more focused on skill. While it's a step in the right direction, it's still different from your traditional Mario Party. Not to mention handheld Mario Parties don't sell that well because the experience is best with friends on a TV. Again, how I previously went over Mario Maker 3DS, again very briefly. F-Zero's got the lack of attention, and the reason why was because Shigeru Miyamoto stated they needed a proper controller. Now, I have no idea whether some behind the scenes happened, but no way on God's earth did a damn controller, especially with how many you have in stock, hindered F-Zero's light of day. Smash is its only light of day, if you ask me. 
Now, what examples have shown them losing their ambitious and intuitive ideas for gameplay and game design? Well, for one, AGAIN, the Wii U to 3DS ports, the generic S Color Splash, Mario Sports Superstars, etc. I'm sorry, I'm repeating myself, but in all honesty, it's not all entirely lost. Before I go on, despite everything I've said before and soon, there are four franchises that do not apply to this discussion. Pokemon, Zelda, Smash, and Kirby. Why? Because these all have intuitive and ambitious ideas, their consumers are pleased and happy with how the games come out so far, and they relatively do well at sales while doing great at quality. What's another factor is these four IPs have different creators, development teams, companies, etc. Masahiro Sakurai and HAL Laboratory is behind Smash and Kirby, Eji Awanuma is behind Zelda, and Satoshi Tajiri slash Game Freak slash Pokemon Company etc. is making Pokemon. Their most recent titles and soon to be released titles prove to be ambitious, clever, appealing, entertaining, and fantastic that they've sold well. The IP slash games used as examples in this discussion, Discount Metroid, were all made or designed by one man, Shigeru Miyamoto. He's well known as the god who created Mario and the other IPs and is seen as legendary and wise, but as of recently, he seems to become, in some ways, a detriment to his own creations. He made Sticker Star to how it was, and was able to make that the basis of Paper Mario. He's made Star Fox Zero with the unnecessarily difficult motion controls. He's made spin-off Marios, 2D Marios, and 3D Marios feel safe. He's even ignored F-Zero for excusing the fact that they need an ideal controller. He even calls Pikmin 3 and Star Fox Zero, two of his own creations, underrated Wii U games. Now, Pikmin is its own gem as far as I've heard, but after what I went over with Star Fox Zero, really? He's not happy his own creations are not getting enough respect even when some of his creations have issues and he has the need to address those. Creators do hate when their creations get turned away, but that leaves room to consider why they got turned away in the first place or issue to begin with, and I went over them. I personally feel he may have some sort of ego at Nintendo, and not that many employees want to speak up or share different ideas without his consent. I respect him for making my childhood and all, but he's done more harm than good as of these past few years, and I just want a reasonable, fun, and lighthearted game again. Not something I go into either expecting and experiencing all over again like before, or something so gimmicky or jarring that the game's quality diminishes. We're almost there, fam. So SMT, explain how they're struggling with their overall marketing strategies and fan medium. Basically how they've portrayed these games so far, these ports seen as a desperate play for money. The games themselves I've touched on, which are sick of me repeating, looking and feeling generic, bland, lackluster, safe, unconvincing, etc. The Wii U being a big flop. This whole planning for the NX reveal being a tad butchered because the PS4 Neo and Apple's iPhone 7 being revealed around the same time the NX was supposed to be revealed, and it's going to go slightly worse than expected and they've dropped in sales and fan following since. Alright, so that's basically all the issues that's making people believe Nintendo's afraid of their fans. Their pants are on too tight, and yet their structure's loose. So how do they fix it? Simply solve the issues I explained. As far as we know, the developers are already working on NX titles, but so far, we know as much as Nintendo giving us info on Cloudcorn and Bayonetta's amiibos. But all we need is let the fans be heard and express their love and devotion without repercussions, Nintendo. Let fans recreate your game so it can strengthen you, your fans, and your company. Don't just give us this average game, slap the Mario brand on it, and say, here's your new game. Give us a reason to buy it. Make it convincing, reasonable, fun, etc. Don't just assume because of the IP it's guaranteed. Create some new elements to convince us and play it smart too. Remember how those IPs played, worked, and built upon to create bigger, better projects. Stop enforcing these unnecessary gimmicks and just experiment with some gameplay elements to make it interesting fun, but be careful. Try and actually listen and pay attention to your fans more in order to please them and most consumers. Giving what the fans and consumers want will ensure those sales. Stop being so uptight about these fan-made creations and just try and be open-minded with fans. It's not going to kill you. And also try and throw out more ads and promotions to more of your games and your products overall. Carefully show what the products are, show us why we need it, and make it marketable and convincing again. Because as of now, some people believe Nintendo is dead. Dead? No, no, no. We have an amusement park on the way. They're they're leaping into mo the mobile market. They're not dead. On the verge of dying? Mm, that's like an iffy... maybe? It really depends. 
All I'm hoping is Nintendo will be a bit more open to fans' ideas, suggestions, requests, and creations, realize some of their problems and work on fixing them, and they regain some ground and stature by the time the NX is revealed. It's expected this month, so I'll likely give my thoughts on what the NX will be and what it'll need. So stick around for that if you're interested, subscribe for more if you enjoyed this, and let's hope the NX will be the beginning of a new era for Nintendo. The theme part 2, there's also that I'm hyped for. So if I'm not playing a game on here, I guess I'll see you guys when I give my thoughts on the NX. Thank you for watching, and stay super.